Are you sure it's me? I mean that because I was not there. It's you. I didn't Tell know. Me. I am. I did not hurt Travis. If Travis were here today, he would tell you that it wasn't me. I'll cover the most essential parts of Jody's interrogation. This interrogation is a textbook example of how statement analysis, SA, and conversation analysis, CA, convict suspects before they confess. Both methods agree that language is meaningful and should be analyzed as such, and both methods are detail-oriented. I'll point out Jody's deceptive speech patterns and explain them in both written and spoken language. Travis's case ever since it happened mm -hmm. okay and I know exactly when it happened when he was killed I know a lot of details now the stage is set in the next excerpt Jody mentions Abe a guy she went out with according to Jody this was before she started dating Travis and that was in Pasadena yeah if you pay for it today yeah that was in Pasadena and the following evening I went out with my friend Abe and we, he drinks, and he just got like um, a maker's mark, I think, as well as his drink. And I got cranberry juice. Abe is kind of, he's a little bit older, he's just sort of a businessman. Okay. Has a background in, I don't remember, production or And something. this is during the time that you guys were broken up, or this still kind of going I'm out? sorry, this is before we started dating. Okay. The reason I say this is because he told me a few times, he told me during that conversation too, that he's like, you seem to have a very convenient timeline for when we started dating. Because I, I used to ask him, like, when did we actually start dating? Because I figured if we ever made it to a year, we might as well celebrate it. Um, and he's like, I'm not really sure. And the reason I think it was February 2nd is because we, do you know of Chris and Sky Hughes? Mm -hmm. A subject with guilty knowledge will often apologize to law enforcement the greater authorities. Besides unreliable politeness, apologies suggest deception. Even though subjects are being deceptive, they still have the experiential memory of what they did. In this kind of stressful situation, repressed guilty knowledge frequently results in apologies. The reason I say this is noted because it signifies intention on the subject's part. Jody's showing self-awareness with this choice of words, that there's a deliberate level to her statements. She tries to change focus here and control what the two of them are to talk about. She tries this again later on. Okay, um, I used to spend a lot of time at their house and um, you know, they're a wonderful family and uh, Skye was, she, she's somebody that I really opened up to and you know, um, I told her a little bit how I just wasn't sure about Travis at the time and and I, I wasn't sure what was going on there, and she wrote in this long letter, or she didn't write a letter, Travis wrote the letter, but she um, kind of got on his case, and and I was, and they told me all kinds of things about Travis that I wasn't aware of. Jody gets to speak about a topic she's comfortable with. However, her hesitation indicates that she's stalling, and it suggests that she's making up the story as she goes. These are interjections. In CA, they are called hesitation markers. You know is an expression used for as association purposes. In an interview like this, we should be aware of it because it signifies awareness on the subject's part, that they are aware of the other person in the room. They're not merely narrating. 
And second, the expression presupposes that the subject's telling the truth, even though this is not necessarily the case. A little bit minimizes how Jody didn't get Travis at the time, and thus minimizes the information she gave to Skye, even though she really opened up to her. Kind of is a hedge. Hedges express equivocation, offering the subject leeway to modify or retract their statement at a later point if necessary. All kinds of things is part of Jody's vague narrative. She doesn't state what these things are, so the detective now has to ask her. What kind of stuff are you talking about? Um, they said if I don't get away from Travis, I'm going to become just like Deanna, which is his other ex-girlfriend. Yeah. Um, you know, do you want to waste six years of your life waiting for him? Um... We noticed the victim role that Jody tried to assign herself ever since the early stages of the investigation. She emphasizes information that portrays Travis in a negative light. In the next excerpt, the detective's trying to get an idea of what Jody was doing around the time Travis was murdered. He asks her about a road trip she took in a rented car. Yeah, I got that from other people in Utah. They said you showed up in a Ford Focus. Uh -huh, it was white, four-door. No, um... Control. I like red trips. Cruise control is really good. Again, she's turning the attention to things she likes to talk about. She's personalizing the conversation in a way that's out of place in this kind of environment. Her behavior indicates diversion tactics. You don't remember what company it was? Uh, Who rented maybe. it? I did. Was it was your credit card? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah, I could look it up. And so maybe. you took a trip. And you decided to go to, um, instead of going over to Utah, you went straight out to Los Angeles area? I went to Santa Cruz first. Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. okay. And then I stayed the night in Monterey. And the next day I drove to <coughs> Pasadena, okay. waiting for Laura to call me back. You didn't contact her at all? Uh, she contacted me finally after I'd already left LA. But it was too late, you'd already yeah. left at that point. Yeah, and we had plans to, to do that again this and week. And which route did you take? From, from there. I was supposed to get on the 15 and go all the way up uh -huh. and I somehow got off the 15. Where did you end up? Um, for a while I was lost and I'm not above sleeping in the car so I slept for a while. Okay. I'm a heavy sleeper and I sleep a lot so. First she personalizes the conversation again mentioning personal characteristics. Second, when subjects express themselves in the negative, the thing they're negating is sensitive to them, because they've obviously reflected on this very thing. I'm not above sleeping in the car reveals that Jody's considered that sleeping in the car is in fact beneath her. This information is sensitive to her. But you were on the 15 for a while, mm -hmm. and you ended up getting off the 15 somewhere. Yeah, I, I, I looked at a map, and I'm pretty sure I know where I went. I went, can I draw you a map? Most people would know where they went. Jody prefaces a possible knowledge with the hedge pretty sure. The function of hedges is to indicate uncertainty rather than certainty. And as I mentioned earlier, they offer a deceptive person leeway to modify or retract a statement at a later point without directly contradicting said statement. Again, she's trying to control the interview. Also, drawing a map gives her additional time to think. Sure. Because I eventually started seeing signs um, for Phoenix, and I was like, and it was several hundred miles away still. Like that's weird. Where am I going? Um, so you have California, Los Angeles, and um, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and I was supposed to go somewhere right up here. Oh, I'm a lefty. So the 15 kind of does one of these. Yeah. Goes um, through, let's say, Las Vegas right here. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, my no, that's okay. So that's wrong. okay. She's being playful here, an uncharacteristic trait for an innocent person. She apologizes again. This time, it's for the map she herself insisted on drawing. She makes herself sound dumber than she is in an obvious attempt to suck up to the detective. Notice she wanted to draw the map and sounded sure she could do it. But now that she's failed, it's evident that she was stalling. Hence, she engages in unreliable self-criticism here. 
it's understood that most people, especially in an interview like this, refrain from criticizing themselves unless it has a self-beneficial purpose and or they know they're lying. Jody's quick to admit that her map is wrong. This quick admission suggests that she knew the map was going to be wrong by the time she has to draw it, just a moment earlier. Furthermore, she over-dramatizes her supposed surprise. Linguistically, drawing the map ends up damaging her case more than if she hadn't, even though her intentions were the exact opposite. So we'll just put... Just put I, just, I know it cuts through Arizona in the corner. Um, Las Vegas, um, St. George is somewhere here. And then... The 40 runs somewhere this way, because somehow I, I ended up on the 40. And when I saw the 40, I'm like, the only thing I associate with the 40 is Flagstaff, and Flagstaff is somewhere yeah, north Flagstaff of Utah, right up here. I mean, north, north, northern Arizona. And so, um, and it was, I was going east, and I was like, this isn't, this, what's going on here? I just, I wasn't going the right way. And so I, um, I've had for the last two years, I've had a car that has a GPS system in it. Mm -hmm. It's really good, and um, it, I think it's, sir, it hasn't served me as far as getting a sense of direction when I moved to Palm Desert. Indirectly, Jody makes a cunning excuse for her unassertive explanations, her alleged bad sense of direction. Likewise, mentioning the GPS system gives her something else to talk about, at least momentarily. She's very self-aware of her language. The self-awareness results in self-serving statements that remove responsibility from her. And you kind of rely on it a little too much. Too much. In fact, when I moved, when I moved in with the, the last place I lived in Arizona, I did not know how close it was to Travis. I didn't realize. Um, I have a very bad sense of direction, and it wasn't until I began to, I used my GPS the whole time I was there pretty much just to find things. Um, anyway, so I got back, I looked at the map quest that I had, I had mapped quest a bunch of places. I was maybe going to go to Death Valley. Jody parrots the interview is too much. Parroting is the easy way out, and in this case, she's parroting a slight criticism of herself, which points to an unreliable statement. She removes herself from Travis and the crime. Notice the subtle way she inserts this utterance, prefacing it with the intensifying in fact. On a surface level, she may seem easygoing, but she's still highly self-protective. There's vowel stress on not, and there's no contraction. Between the lines, she's telling us that this information is sensitive, important for her to get across. Deceptive people often emphasize what they know is a lie. Paradoxically, it's this emphasis that ends up giving them away. Because why the need to bring it up at this point? Also, the fact that she's formulating this as an unmotivated negative statement points to deception. She's the one bringing attention to something that she didn't know. Unmotivated negative formulations bring attention to the very thing they're trying to negate. I say unmotivated because if the detective had asked her, did you know how close it was to Travis, she could have made the reliable denial, no, I didn't. This is not the case here. We observe her excuse again. Apparently, repetition of this piece of information, first indirectly and now directly, is important to Jody, especially as the walls are closing in around her. So you, you took this trip and you left on, was it Monday the 2nd, right? And you didn't get to Utah until Thursday, you told me. Yeah, I got to Utah on Thursday. So Thursday, and that's the 5th? Mm, yeah, I think so. so. Monday, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah, 5th. Okay, so we have, it's like 48 hours there that, well, obviously three days, but there's plenty, there's 48 hours. So this trip took you a little over 48 hours there. Mm -hmm. um, I have a problem with this trip. Well, I okay. went first too. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know you went down here. Okay. I mean, obviously, Wairika, right there, beautiful little place here, except it's kind of smoky. Yeah, I can't right see now. the views. <laughs> I was hoping to see some mountains, but... You really should see, see Mount Shasta. Okay. I've gone over this trip over and over. 
into my mind and on paper. And even if there's still 20 some odd hours, even if you pulled over to sleep a couple of times. Oh, did I tell you that I got stranded? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that. If you slept for 10 hours, I only slept for about here an hour. and here, it would still leave 18 some odd hours yeah. for something else. Okay. This is what people are focusing on, is this trip that you took. Because they're saying she left, she didn't get to till Thursday. Wednesday? That's when Travis was killed. I did not go near his house, isn't there? This passage deserves elaboration. Linguistics distinguishes between locutionary and illocutionary speech acts. Locutions are just the statements or questions themselves, while illocutions are the implications of said statements and questions. We can relate these speech acts to the scholar Roland Barthes' distinction between denotations and connotations. When we look at this photo on a hair salon's website, along with the tagline New York Cosmetic Experience, the photo and tag lines are simply denotations, the basic meaning. However, the photo and tag line connote something else. In this case, perhaps exclusivity or luxury. Companies rely on the connotations of consumers. And in conversations, we also observe these connotations or elocutions. People respond to the implications of each other's statements. On the most basic level, the detective statement is a locution, the statement itself. However, there's an illocutionary force at play in a statement, meaning it has hidden implications. The reason why we're able to know this is that Jody reacts to these implications. To her, the detective statement connotes an indirect accusatory mention of her. Jody's first impulse is not to say that she didn't kill Travis. It's to say that she didn't go near his house, which is a more distancing expression. Distancing language is going to be a pattern in her denials. Distancing language is common for guilty people that are trying to repress their experiential memory. When people lie, they look for the most comfortable way of doing it. And the most comfortable way is the one that causes the least amount of stress. However, Jody is the one bringing attention to Travis's house. So the house is on her mind, in her experiential memory. We know this because she says this. In the following, notice Jody's use of well. Well is a discourse marker. Its main function is to show that we're thinking about the question we've been asked or the statement we've just heard. It can indicate a way of stating something slightly differently, while still remaining on good terms with the other speaker. Jody makes excessive use of this marker in the rest of this conversation, which also points to internal stress that the detective statements affect her. I pulled your cell records. Your cell phone was turned off between here and here. Okay, but the last place it pulled it was here. The next place it turned on was here. What does that show me? Oh, well, I began. Oh, no, no, no. Is there plenty of time for you to do that? Yes. And I do I believe that you had come to visit Travis? Yes. I truly believe it. Did you have the opportunity? Yes, you were traveling alone. There's no other witnesses. Your phone just happened to turn off from here to here. Well, I didn't turn it off physically, but it died. And then it magically, you, oh you found your charger here? It was, it was under the, packed under the seat of the passenger side. And it was when I was... When you were lost, you couldn't have maybe pulled over and found it or... Well, I did finally start looking when I was stranded. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pulled over when I was lost. She says, wouldn't have, not I didn't. Wouldn't have tells us two things. First, that she allegedly doesn't remember. And second, that she speaks generally, not specifically. If she had said, I didn't, her denial would have referred to the specific act of pulling over. But she leaves us with this distancing verb choice, Telling us what she wouldn't have done, not what she didn't do. Okay, this I've been focusing on this and going over and over my mind why this happened, 
why your phone turns off here, outside of Los Angeles? What city is that? Because I got towards, as far as um. It's not cities. There's towers. Oh, okay. Well, okay, I got. There's towers dotted all over this place. Yeah. One tower hit here. The other tower here on the 93. There is no way somebody can get on that 15 and magically get on that 93. Because that 15 goes right through Las Vegas, right there, and continues this way. It well, never goes through Arizona again. I, I got off before Las Vegas. Okay. And this tower here, it's not just over the border in Arizona. It's quite a distance inside of Arizona that it hit. Because there is a mountain range all along here. And if you're on this side of the mountain range, pretty good distance, that signal's not going to come, not going to hit Utah, or, Utah uh, or Nevada or California. It's only going to hit in Arizona. Well, I had somehow gotten off the 15 and got onto the 40. Okay. Is what happened? Well, the only way you can get on the 40 is if after you cross the bridge or the, uh, the dam. I think, the, I think I got on the 40 in California. From the 15. Well, like, because I had actually gotten, I actually began to drive the 10 west. As an adverb, actually indicates that the subject's comparing two contradictory thoughts at the same time, thus actually reveals undisclosed information. Jody is an unreliable narrator. But you see what I'm saying, the confusion that we're having? And, and we'll come back to this. Well, I got on the 40 somewhere over here. In California. Yeah, and continued to drive this way. Realized I was not in the right place at all. And then I got onto the, no the 93 North. And then I hit the 15 again. And then I went through Las Vegas and then St. George and then on to Utah. Okay. That still doesn't make any sense to me. And I can pull the maps and show them to you and you can go over and over and over again. But I don't think you're being completely honest with me about, about that trip. I honestly got lost. It's, it's bad timing. Her repetition points to internal stress while she's visibly over-dramatizing her frustration, as if she's just a victim of bad timing. With honestly, she parrots the detective, parroting as a way of showing the other speaker that you're attending to the statement or question in detail. Politicians do this in interviews. By parroting the journalist, they're pretending to provide honest and well-meaning answers. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, n I was nowhere near Mesa. I was nowhere near no. Phoenix. <sighs> I wasn't even close to him. Um, what if I could show you proof you were there? Well, Would that change your mind? I wasn't there. You can be honest with me, Jody. I was not at Travis's house. Was not. You were at Travis's house. You guys had a sexual encounter, which there's pictures. And I know you know there's pictures because I have them. I will show them to you. Okay. So, what I'm asking you is for you to be honest with me. I know you were there. Are you sure those pictures aren't from another time? Positive. Absolutely positive. The last time I had any kind of contact with Travis was in April. Are you sure it's me? I mean, because I was not there. With her final utterance, it's as if she suddenly remembers that she has to say this. She even initiates it with the hitch I mean, so linguistically she's unsure of this assertion. There's a duality in her language that's out of her control because she can't completely repress her experiential memory. Again, she avoids contraction in her denial, which, combined with I mean, points to unreliable information. It's you. And you know it's you. I know all the details of this case. The only thing I don't know is why. 
why did you choose to go visit Travis that day? And why did you do what you did? Why, Joe? In SA, it's understood that the brain doesn't want to lie, so it'll choose the easiest way to do it. Jody doesn't say, I didn't hurt Travis, thereby denying the specific action. She says, never. Never is a general and distancing expression that's commonly associated with unreliable denials. And since Jody is not denying the specific action, this is an unreliable denial. Also, hurt should be noted as a euphemism. She doesn't say kill. Euphemisms are frequently applied by deceptive people to minimize the harm they've caused and simultaneously present themselves in a more favorable light. Later, Jody herself makes a telling distinction between these two verbs, hurt and kill. You did. You hurt him. That's why we're here. That's why I flew up here. Because I needed to talk to you about this. I can just arrest you and throw you in jail, but I want to know why. Why did you do this to him? I wouldn't hurt Travis. He's done so much for me. The detective's letting Jody know it's too late for her to make excuses. Jody has changed never to wouldn't, which is also distancing. The interesting thing about this verb choice is that wouldn't doesn't exclude that Jody did hurt Travis. The person could potentially have done something to another person that they wouldn't do. Didn't and wouldn't are not mutually exclusive. This is an even more unreliable denial. There's so much evidence in that house. So much. And it all points to you. I, I lived there. I was there for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. I know you took pictures of him in the shower just before he died. I don't think he would allow that. Mm -hmm. Instead of reliably denying the detective's suggestion, Jody introduces a hypothetical that's prefaced with a hitch, which again marks uncertainty. And the camera actually took a couple of photos by accident during the time he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Jody, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. It's time for you to just come out and, I and didn't tell know. me. I didn't know. I did not hurt Travis. I did not hurt Travis. I wouldn't do that to him. The late timing of these denials makes them unconvincing. And once more, her denials contain the distancing euphemism heard. The repetition suggests that she's rehearsing how to answer. She's trying to persuade, as opposed to actually persuading. And once more, wouldn't doesn't exclude that she actually did that to Travis. This one, you absolutely cannot, can, cannot explain that away. You either had blood on your hand and you touched the wall or there was blood on the wall and you touched the blood. Could my palm print have already been there no. and then blood touched it? Joey. Joey. This is over. This is absolutely over. You need to tell me the truth. Listen, the truth is I did not hurt Travis. Okay, so... The detective's confronting statements don't make Jody back down. Instead, she uses the imperative listen and thus sounds more assertive. She's again parroting the detective. This time, it's the noun truth. With okay, so, she's again trying to control the conversation. She's letting the detective know that according to her, they've now finished debating the issue and that it's time for a new topic. But the detective's not letting her get away with this. Joey, you can continue to do this, okay? A records check shows you that you uh, has reported a, a gun stolen. 25 auto just happens to be the same caliber as the weapon used to kill him. 
The 25 auto was used to kill Travis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along with the multiple stab wounds. Jody, if you want, I can show you some pictures of him. Do you want to see pictures of him? Part of me does and part of me doesn't. Why, because you don't want to remember? No, I Jody. just, there's a morbid curiosity. This statement is inconsistent with her supposedly feeling sad. This isn't the typical expression a person would use if they were indeed crying over a lost loved one. Therefore, she doesn't fake cry because of Travis. She fake cries because she knows she's exposed. This is another futile attempt to sound sincere and fish for sympathy. Jody. I wanted to know how he died. We can keep playing these games over and over again. I'm not going to believe you. When right. you start telling me the Listen. truth, then I can believe you. But I can't deny this evidence. I can't. The trip you took doesn't make sense. The opportunity was there. Your pictures on that date with him. Your blood is in the house. Mixed with his. Mixed. Not alongside, but mixed. Your hair is there with blood. And your palm print is there in blood. I, it's over. Could it have been my blood from before? Your image is not important right now. Saving the rest of your life is. Listen, if I'm found guilty, I don't have a life. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. Even though she makes three conditional clauses with if, this passage is an admission of guilt. First, she uses the word guilty, showing the detective that it's been on her mind, that her denials and pointless questions have been attempts to protect herself, to avoid the consequences of confessing. Second, she distinguishes between the verbs hurt and kill. So, first we hear the euphemism hurt again, and then the real verb, killed. By placing herself in this context, she's letting us know what she did. Additionally, these conditional clauses don't occur in a reliable context, saying she would beg for this punishment. If you were in my shoes and I had this evidence against, against you, what would you say? If I had that evidence against you, it'd yeah. be pretty obvious. But I guess being in my position, I, it just seems so impossible. I'd want to see it. I'd want to know. I mean, I'm not like I'm not a murderer, but I guess if I were to do that, I would wear gloves or you know something. I just how could my I don't know. Jody's self-protective stance is weak. She starts with admitting that it would be pretty obvious. Then she moderates with a conjunction, but. What follows this conjunction is the syntactic focus in an utterance. However, it's weakened by her saying it just seems. This isn't Jody saying that it is impossible, and she's not directly denying it. The second time she says but is the most significant. Linguistically, she's negating her own assertion that she's not a murderer. Because again, what follows but is the syntactic focus. She then quote-unquote pretends to think like a murderer. Likewise, she uses the associating you know here, indirectly letting the detective know that the thoughts she's sharing right now are sensitive to her. Jody doesn't need a lie detector test. Her own language incriminates her. In the following, she keeps acting surprised about the information the detective's giving her. I know you tried to wash him off, try to get some of the blood off, try to clean him up a little bit, but you're even denying the pictures. Have you been there? There's pictures of you laying on the bed in pigtails. Pigtails? Yes. And I've got pictures of you that I've blown up and you've got the little mole right there. It's the same one. It's you, it's obvious. I can show you some of these pictures. Do you want to see the pictures? Will that change your mind? I mean, I am curious. Okay, let me take a break and let me go find them. And I'll bring them and show you. I wasn't there. But you need to think about what you're saying. This continuing to lie is not going to help you. 
If you can do something I didn't do, it won't help me either. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. And I say, I did it. Here, her conditional clause casts doubt on her not having committed the crime. She says, if it's something I didn't do. Also, she lets us know what's on her mind, that she's thinking ahead. She's contemplating her defense, which is the next step after a subject's confession. Again, her own words betray her. And again, she's indirectly revealing that the questions she's asked and the maps she asked to draw were diversion tactics. I mean... The motive is there. The jealousy issue. But I wasn't... I wouldn't even say it was jealous. I mean, there, um, there may have been some jealousy there, but... Then what is I think it? What anyone, caused this? I think if, you know, if anyone, maybe Travis was jealous, but... <clears throat> That's not what everybody else says. Well, they know he was jealous, but they think that you are absolutely obsessed. Obsessed is the word that they use. That's the word I hear from everybody. Fatal attraction. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Look at Jody. Jody had to have done this, or she got someone to do it for him. There's not one person that says anything else. What did you do with the gun? I don't have a gun. They're going through your house right now, so... Are they going to find anything there that will lead you back to this? I don't think they would. I mean, there's nothing that could link me there. I mean, that's pretty compelling, I have to admit. If you found my palm print there, I don't know. I just, that's... She uses the hitch, I mean, and thereby retracts her own preceding denial. I have to admit, speaks to her stubbornness and persistence to keep lying. Her way of phrasing this shows unwillingness to admit not because the evidence isn't there, but because she doesn't want to. Jody reveals prominent personality traits here, stubbornness, but also a lack of conscience, because she's not willing to admit because of guilt or remorse. Her concern is herself. You have a pair of sweatpants that stripes around the backside with zippers. Um, Somebody's seen you wearing those before. I've got so many clothes. Yeah, I think I do. Wait. I have a, well, I have a zipper, one that zips in the back. Mm -hmm. It's got like stripes, uh, like big stripe on it on the side. Well, it's got a black stripe all the way down and they're white. It's yeah. got the black. I have those, they're at the house. Okay. It's got, um, I have two pairs actually. One is too small and one is just about right. Um, the other one I bought anyway, that was too small because it was on sale and it's a good deal. Um, but yeah, they have stripes and they have zipper. Well, what does that mean? What is that? I believe you were wearing a pair like that when this, when this happened. Even at this stage in the conversation, sitting in front of a completely distrusting detective, Jody continues to personalize the conversation. It doesn't matter if she's doing this deliberately or subconsciously at this point. What matters is that she doesn't react like most people would. She remains unemotional and makes misplaced comments. Take a little break, but I need you to think about what you're doing here. Because the best thing for you to do is to tell me the truth. You tell me exactly what happened, because you know what? I think your mom and your dad really deserve the truth. They're going to be asking. And it's absolutely... It, it's so important that you tell me why this occurred, what was going through your mind, and what caused you to do this. It happened, and I can prove it happened, and there's no doubt in my mind, and there absolutely is no doubt in anybody else's mind who's investigating this, that you were there and that you did this. These are just a few photos. And I want to be careful showing, not showing you certain photos Please because some of them me. are very, very bad. That's obviously Travis's house, right? Remember that? Um, yeah. 
Thomas were here today, he would tell you that if it wasn't me. No. My job is to speak for Travis right now, and everything Travis is telling me is that Jody did this to me. Have you ever shot that 25 mm hmm Have you ever touched it? The one that was stolen? No, I've never seen it. I said it looks like a toy gun. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a 25 looks like. I know what a 22 looks like. It's just what... like a 22, actually. Well, the 22s that I saw kind of looked like the ones in the westerns where they had the barrel and the long. You know. Jody Faye cries, but again, what she mentions here is inconsistent with feelings of sadness. In other words, her nonverbal language, her crying, doesn't line up with her verbal language. In conclusion, we've observed how Jody proves major areas within the essay. Number one, she's answered questions with questions, trying to buy more time. Number two, she's used equivocating language, designed to retract or modify her statements at a later point. Number three, she's made unreliable denials that were unspecific to the crime at hand. Number four, we've heard euphemisms designed to minimize the crime she's committed. And number five, she's made indirect admissions of guilt.